Yeah. Okay, guys, we're team Tyrion canister, <laughs> which is similar to a container. For those of you who don't know. <laughs> <laughs> and our project is the Tyrion canister neural style GUI. So, if you've ever seen any infomercials, you know those people who like can't do a simple task, right? They like spill milk, getting it out of the fridge, whatever, stuff like that. So if you're trying to build, use the neural styles thing, it's kind of similar, except like way harder. So <laughs> we decided to try to simplify that process and make it like way more user friendly. Um, we built this really nice GUI, <laughs> and you um, just input in every field, or not because there are default values. And then you press the and you're like, not present at the moment. But yeah, and then it'll it'll build your um, neural style picture for you, <laughs> which we will see in a minute. Uh, right. So um, I'm sure you all remember the neural style project um, and how it took hours to install everything and um, to run it. Well, Docker makes it uh, easier and faster for you. So you no longer have to leave your laptop and go away for lunch or whatever to the gym. Uh, okay. <laughs> so, thanks to Docker, you can uh, do it in a much faster. <laughs> All you have to do is just wow. to run Docker and pull the image for you. Uh, oh, okay. So uh, it's easy to integrate in other systems, and it's uh, open source, um, so everybody can uh, recreate it easily and uh, check it out on my GitHub. Yes, please. Um, right. So why would you ever need to uh, create a neural painting? Uh, well, if, for for example, to create customized fun. Um, E-cards uh, for your friends. <laughs> okay, so how can you contribute that? Again, it's an open source project. <laughs> you can help us make it faster because it's still fast, but uh, not fast enough. So are you ready to test it? Okay. Yes. Yeah. Yay! Okay. <laughs> I gotta get my terminal open too. Oh my god. Okay. So we already loaded up the container because it would take a while. So, so it's a Python script. Um, and run it like this. And woo! Ooh. Lots of gooey. So you put in URLs for the um, for the style <laughs> images. So or content and style. It's <laughs> okay. Okay, everything's fine. So that's the content image, and then we're gonna paste that. And then style image, paste that. We're gonna leave everything else blank because it's faster and there are default values. And we're gonna hit enter, and it's gonna start, and it's gonna take a minute. <laughs> There it goes. Oh my gosh. Our X11 socket, which <laughs> is really important. <laughs> but 
Why? Why? Because um, so Docker doesn't like automatically come with a like way to load interfaces, user interfaces, um, to see them. So you have to kind of force it into the right. <laughs> <laughs> I, have, I don't have a question, but I had a comment. I was actually thinking about making you know. it, uh, Sorry, I'm sorry. Uh, I was actually thinking of making a like a GUI for something, but I just I looked it up and researched and found that Docker doesn't immediately do that. Like it doesn't record all the visual input and stuff. So props to you for figuring out what you can do. I think it's a. <laughs> So um, we had to go all the way to, like, I forget what, some dependency, like, Torch's um, new uh, protocol for, like, installing um, itself in all of its dependencies because it, like, the version that was being used in the documentation that we used was outdated. Did you guys come across that? <laughs> so, um, you guys did not come across the PPA issue, adding the PPA um, that was IPython that was deprecated for IPython? Okay, just curious. Maybe you guys, do you guys um, work off of a base image? <laughs> uh, the Ubuntu one? The Ubuntu one, and then you just copy the steps from the documentation for your stuff? Yeah. Okay. I see. Yeah, it took a while. Alright, cool, cool. Cool. Hey, well. Wait, can you can you learn to the you... Alright, just yeah, go ahead. I just wanted to say I was trying to do the same thing on my machine. I was working with Romantic. She had a uh, Linux machine natively <coughs> and we're trying to do it on my computer as well. And the GUI weren't working on my computer, but they're working on hers. Um, so we thought I might have to do something with uh, Apple computer against being just a Linux computer because we had exactly the same everything, but it wasn't working properly in my machine. So, but it was working uh, properly on a Linux machine. Yeah. So what was the error we said? Yes. So, did like you guys have this one on a on Mac as well? Uh, yeah, I don't know what the issue is. Yeah, I think they just tell you. Hi, did you find them? No, Nathan it, seems no, to know what the Mac really issue right. is. That's the X. Oh, yeah. the, the X it's only so. three minutes for questions. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so, basically, uh, so, so, you have like, you have I have a mic. Come on. It's off. <laughs> So basically, uh, like you mentioned, mounting the X11 socket, basically X is a window windowing server that runs on Linux. It's sort of like the low-level piece that handles like making windowed applications in Linux. And so the reason it wouldn't work on your Mac is because when you run Docker on your Mac, you're actually running it inside of a, a what's called a headless virtual machine, right? It doesn't have any display. That's why it's headless. But um, you know, you're only going to have access to X to actually display stuff on like native Linux. Uh, so I hope that kind of helps. And you're mounting, when you mount in a socket. Basically what you're saying is, I have this special file that I can write to to display windows on my system. And so when you're mounting in the socket, you're sharing that file with the container. So does that make sense? Or? Okay, cool. But there's, there's a way around that, to have an X server on your Mac too. There's a special program for that. Yeah. But by default it doesn't exist, because this system is only used by Linux. We were looking into X quartz. Right. Yeah. yeah, that'd be one. Yeah. That's what Julian just mentioned. Yeah, basically. That, that's yeah. what we're trying to use for. Yeah. Thing. Yeah. There's. There's the there's that the picture. Today, I don't believe in kissing up, though I will point out that Solomon 
hit us up today and wished us luck. So when y'all see your boss, let him know that we say thank you and we appreciate all the support, his belief in our product. <laughs> so yeah, we're deep into doing it. If you want to hit our next slide, Rona. We are a neural network imaging for everybody. Next slide, please. <laughs> Back one slide. <laughs> there you go. This was inspired by the Holberton School Neural Style Project. So those of you that don't know that, it is a quick process to put photographs into a system and combine them using neural networks. It's really cool. You get some interesting results. But it's a little complicated. We looked through Docker Hub and saw a lot of images of neural style, but all of them needed simplifying. So that's what we decided to do. We decided to take the best um, of the, the most up-to-date, the most reliable components, custom build them into a container, and try to make it easy to use. We want Docker to be able to reach out to people that haven't traditionally used the product, people that haven't traditionally had access to things like simple neural networks, to be able to engage with them and build cool things they can share with their friends and get the word out about both Docker and neural networks. Um, so what did we bring to the table that's different? We use the volumes uh, process to link folders inside our container with folders outside our container on our host machine. That's le that lets people manage the photos they want to load into the system, as well as the output very efficiently. They don't have to figure out how to move things in and out of the container. We handled that for them. The other thing we did, we optimized the settings. They're a little different when we see the demo, uh, but we actually optimized the settings for good pictures without too much time on the processor. Um, and then we added an interactive prompt for users to choose those images. So you'll see what happens. You get a little prompt, and you can pick your in-picture and your out-picture and what you want to call your, uh, your final product, and it's all nice and streamlined. Next slide. This is us, Team Minute to Minute, Rona Chong, Lee McCann, and she's going to demo. Uh, no, it's okay. Um, so let me, first of all, we have a bash script that you get from our GitHub. Uh, control K. Actually, <laughs> yeah, okay. So, um, I'm in Neural Style Master for my downloads, that's from my GitHub. Um, and there's a bash file, and you run it. And, uh, it pulls the image, and then it runs it. Um, but why we have a bash script, it's like the run command for the image is actually a little bit complicated because we needed to use it um, with the dash V option. And we also had to set the memory settings for the Docker machine a little bit high because it's um, going to use a lot of memory to run. So that kind of automates it for them. And it takes a little bit because there are a lot of dependencies. <laughs> oh, it's three minutes. Here comes our prompt in just a second. But thank you all very much. <laughs> So uh, while we're waiting, uh, what about GPU? Have you guys given any thought to that? Yeah, we don't have them on the uh, the desktops we're working on. So it, it, yeah, it would be easy to implement, but we just didn't have that um, capability on the desktops. Well, I think what, what he wants to say is they wanted to, you know, everybody to have access to this, and, and since <laughs> GPU is really expensive and not, uh, a lot of people do have that, well, they, they wanted to focus on the CPU, right? I was asking them, dude. <laughs> <laughs> it is easy and possible so, to implement, right? but it's, it, it is simpler for I was kind of aiming this at my mom and my grandmother as users, and this is one less flag they had to pick and one less thing they had to implement. All right, uh, I mean, do you have an idea of sort of like uh, what you would do? Because like, I'm pretty sure it's pretty standard for this kind of stuff. Like, you pretty much have to use GPU. Like, what, have you thought about it? Or? Yeah, oh yeah, there's a, what's called CUDA, and it's just one more little thing you can add in um, as you're putting your other packages together. And then you just have to implement a couple, um, couple commands with flags in the command line. And uh, yeah, then it works. We did use it. Some of us did use it when we when we did the original project. So no, it's not hard to implement. Yeah, actually, using the CPU is 
the thing that you have actively have to say and to work around that you need to be able to see what you're seeing she's prompted what image do you want to go in what style do you want and then it'll ask you what you want to name the output and like I said, all these are available both in the container, but they also end up out outside the container. So if you have somebody like my grandmother who actually kills the container by accident, she's still got her cute cat, cat pictures. <laughs> <laughs> Love you, Grandma, if you see this online. But you won't, because you don't know what the internet is. sensibilities and this was actually inspired by our captain's logs um, I had this desire to just quickly log some thoughts about hassle but still have like a nice representation of my uh, entries without having to load up like a heavy WordPress blog or like just have something playing like a whole bunch of text files so we wanted to make use of Docker's power to display web apps quickly and efficiently um, but also to create an isolated file system and to just do something neat and cool with that. So basically, what we did is create a static site that is a visual representation of the OS file system using uh, Flask and Python. So it's just a small little web app. And Joe is loading it up right now. So what is he doing here? Um, it looks like he's about to run our container, which we actually loaded beforehand, because it takes just a little bit. So now he's in a container, and when he runs server python dot or python server dot py, <laughs> um, it's gonna load up our web app on a python server. So he just goes to zero dot zero dot zero dot zero. That's the little uh, pocket line. Actually, can you increase the text a little bit? Just now? I don't know if it was minimized before. So, it's uh, very <laughs> minimalist, but it's also cute. And <laughs> can you make sure that the volume is on? <laughs> One minute. All right, so if you go up and click on Nurse Joy over there, so you can create a file. <laughs> and uh, so you can fill out the title here, and you can pick plain text or HTML. Um, you can also fill in the file with some body text, so if you wanted, you could put HTML formatting too. Alright. So once he goes and clicks submit, oh, we're actually going to um, <laughs> refresh the, the server. Um, so, in long term, if we're thinking about developing this app further, we believe it should be simple to uh, have the server refresh without stopping it and starting it. But, um, so I hope you can see the potential here. And also, uh, he, just, <laughs> he just put ls to show that um, a, a file should have been created, so maybe that's the test file over there. Um, but go ahead and restart the, the server so that we can see the result on the home page. That's the time. Right. So if he goes to the home page, you should see another entry. Say boo, and actually, um, so the file was created, but if you click on it right now, it's not linked up, but it should be simple to do that too. We just have it. <laughs> <laughs> but you see, so 
It's very uh, extensible. You can create a text editor and <laughs> instead of a form, and you can delete. We could you could think of ways to delete files and modify files. So it's just something fun and cute. So I hope you like the idea. It's a proof of concept. <laughs> So what the server we were um, loading it with is called Cherry Pi. Um, so we can also run Python, um, but it, I think maybe because we routed the ports a certain way, it was just going when we load it up in the browser, it uses Cherry Pi. So I think maybe we had to do some more work to make Cherry Pi refresh without we yeah. had to stop and start again. Interesting. Yeah, you might want to take a look at just invoking the built-in Flask server, like um, Python, and then run the Flask. Yeah. And it's like Aptos run, mm. whatever. Um, that's cool. I like the Pokemon. Uh, my one question is uh, if you, like in this form, if you choose plain HTML, yeah. and then you put in like some JavaScript, do you guys know about that yet? Like, so cross <laughs> uh, You mean, uh, are you asking if we sanitize like, the input? Yeah, or yeah. No, so but definitely you... doable. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm just curious, if, like, if you know about that, because that's the immediate thing that I jump to, seeing that somebody like able to put HTML straight into an input. Is that I'm just like, oh, I wonder if you can type like open script tag alert hello got owned close script tag. Yeah, but, um, this is also uh, one thing to mention. It's not really meant to be a public uh, diary, although you could definitely do work to make it public. It's just meant nice. to be about on your computer, so it's for yourself. So, I mean, you could accidentally do that, but um, <laughs> I mean, if you're a hacker and you're using this, we you know, expect you to know that yeah. <laughs> what will work and what shouldn't. Although, yeah, you, we can also sanitize the input. Yeah, also, like, uh, you have this little timestamp. Yes, yeah, so we were, like, so you <laughs> can see where our direction was. Um, we were going to put the timestamp of when the file was created so yeah. you can know where it was. And we put it at the top also because um, you want to reference the most recent. I really like the design. Um, Thank you. Did you. The font is like, did you, what did you, how did you make the font? It's a Google font. Um, Google. I just wanted it up being quick, uh, but also like kind of a terminal SD, so that's what I looked up. Nice. I was the first result that popped up. Good times. It's going to be right down the style of the lane. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so my name is Rick Harris. This is Mason Fish. We are Team Coffee Run. So we're hoping to get coffee in Seattle, because it'll be good. Um, <laughs> so uh, if you go to our first slide, our very first slide, go up. All of you. There we go. All right, so uh, our project name is The Gauntlet, um, and it is Platform Testing Simplified. So if you're a Holberton student like myself, um, you've created C, because that's what we do, and C is awesome. Um, and it has to be uh, it has to be compiled on Linux 14.04, and you don't have that readily on your system because you're running Mac, because that's what we have here at the school. So uh, if you want to go to the next slide, um, the problems you run into is you're code testing on non-native platforms. You compile the code and set a bunch of errors and you spend the next 15 minutes to figure out because you compiled it on Mac and not on Vagrant. <laughs> um, virtual, virtual environments, uh, you have to load Vagrant and it slows down your system performance and then uh, you ensure that, um, the other problem is that the test environments don't match between developers. So if you have multiple developers working on the same project, they could be working in different environments with different things loaded. Uh, so our solutions, um, is that is the gauntlet. In the gauntlet, you provide us with a repository for the GitHub. Um, so this ensures that developers are pushing commits consistently, uh, so that way they can't just run it from their local repositories. Um, you select the language that you've coded in, so C, Python, Ruby, and you choose the platform you want to run it on. And then our system will spin up a Docker image, 
uh, with the necessary uh, requirements. So, like for C, it will load uh, GCC and uh, Python, it will load Python and pip and all of that. And then you get uh, test results on the user interface. So, for a quick demo, um, oh, uh, thank you. Uh, let's show you the front end first. So, this is Originally, we started out building this as just a program that you can run on your computer, and then uh, we decided to have it pull from your GitHub repo and then turn it into basically like a software as a service. So this is the front end here. You would select your, uh, you put in your GitHub repo here, and then you would save it, and then you go to hit test. So right now, we actually haven't connected the front end to the back end, but the back end does work. So I'm going to just jump to that, which is open. So we did this in Python using Flask. Um, here's the API. So now it's running. So if I, right now what I have is, I'm expecting a, um, a, uh, a container ID, or actually an image ID, which you put in in the URL, uh, and then it will run. Uh, so right now it's waiting, it will run the C file that's located there. So. Okay. Oh. okay, so here's the test file. It's in my uh, repo. It's just a test repo right here. If I adjust it right now, connecting the front and back end, which isn't included on the list because that was close to being done. And um, okay. so multi-platform testing, custom platform via Docker file, custom file execution, automated repository testing, on new commits. Right now, the response. Right now, the response is the same response that the compiler would give. Okay. Uh, yeah. It's especially cool. I mean, you can run the same code on like many different versions. This, the hard coded version right now is just on Ubuntu. But if if I had given the idea of an image that was in like um, CentOS or, or 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 a different version of Ubuntu, um, it, you know, the same thing it would work all the same. So, do you enter like the file names, or it just automatically um, tests all the files together that are in it? So right now it defaults to main.c. Uh, we'd also put in like uh, make file for C, so that way uh, if you're submitting C, then it would expect the make file in the uh, root of the directory. But right now it just defaults to a main.c file in the root of the directory. Other questions? All right. All right. All right. So it's Nero time again. <laughs> <laughs> but not just any type of images, uh, two images that combine content with style. Uh, for instance, we have here uh, Henry Matisse's one with a hat, combining that with our Golden Gate Bridge. 
So I'll pass it over to Praline, who will talk about the process. Yeah. We combine images mainly by using three steps. The first step is to pull a pre-existing image. We, in our case, we use OpenBlue and then create a create a container from the from the image, and it is nothing but a, the interactive shell. The next thing is uh, for creating our own image, we have to. Uh, write a Docker file. Inside the Docker file, we use all the commands for combining the images. Then the final step is nothing but we just committed the changes to the Docker Hub, and this was the expected output. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, other features we meant for this background to look this way. Uh, really hard to make it work. So it changes colors and has funny letters and funny numbers all around. Not sure if was able to run one with the other ones, but no. So basically, uh, this is uh, Docker Arcade for you. Uh, thank you. Any questions? <laughs> Uh, so it's a different, uh, so my computer didn't show, but 
is usually just uh, another pop-up window, basically. So it's, it's in the terminal, but a different window. Oh, okay. Yeah. And, and why couldn't you run that on the same terminal? Uh, because of the X11 socket problem issue, uh, it was needed to uh, needed to download the X cores to make it work on my computer. Uh, so but, it if, wasn't but if it's running in a, in a terminal, why did you have to use X X11? Couldn't you just use it inside the same terminal? That's what we thought, and it wasn't working. Oh. Um, no, because we couldn't exit it well, and we wanted to run multiple games, but. So we opened up in a new window using X11. Yeah. Okay. All right. Makes sense. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So we made a Linux distribution. We called it Mint. <laughs> <laughs> nice try. <laughs> <laughs> what init system do you use? Uh, Mint uses system D. It's port from Ubuntu. Oh, that was pretty good actually. <laughs> So why don't you tell me a little bit about the kernel boot? No. <laughs> Alright, okay, so first thing we're going to do is we're going to run our Docker container. Uh, we're going to start out with the demo, because this is slow and we have three minutes, so if you're lucky, something might actually happen. Um, <laughs> right, so this is setting up a server that's going to have a web front end for creating and running your own neural networks without ever touching a line of code. Um, the idea is that it's very accessible to people who can make use of neural networks without knowing any programming. Um, so you can see here you have a few options of things you can do. Um, so let's go ahead and launch one, you know, add a layer, and 10 iterations should be good. Yeah, okay. Um, so we've got a beautiful graph. I promise you this is actually working, it's just very slow. <laughs> um, the entire um, server is running in Docker, which allows it to be very portable, which is good for neural networks because it means you're going to be able to reproduce the results on any system. With Installing your own libraries and everything, you might have a different version or different inputs, a whole lot of things. Uh, you can wind up neural networks seeing very different results, even if you try running similar or the same exact code on different systems. So Docker is a perfect fit for this kind of a thing. Uh, no, nothing yet? It's running. Okay, it's running, yeah. Um, well, <laughs> there we go, okay. okay. So we've got our first data point here. Oh, and two now. All right, so you can see this graph. Okay. This <laughs> graph is going to keep building itself like this uh, as it runs. Um, which, so you can try a bunch of different parameters for your neural networks in the other screen, and you can just let it run in this screen, and you'll get a visualization of what you can do. And all of this, I think, is pretty accessible for someone who doesn't know at all how to program, which is the real goal. And this is working on the MNIST set for handwritten digits, by the way, um, which it's doing quite poorly on. This is not a good network. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, there are many more um, add-ons that we could add, uh, more data sets so that we could do images, uh, text analysis, and all those stuff. We could, yeah, different types of networks. Uh, we could just add more layers, uh, and we can just add as many neurons as we want, uh, we can modify all that, and the goal is uh, later to be able to um, just add all of this stuff to the front page and uh, just seeing all the results and be able to graph more stuff. All right. Thank you guys. Thank you. What kind of um, library are you using to make the graph? Okay, so we were using a couple of things. Uh, the graph is yeah, the graph comes from high charts. Um, the uh, the way we were able to update everything is through a Flask socket I/O. Um, what is that? Is that really just it's web sockets. Yeah, web sockets. Um, and uh, overall, it worked pretty well. We were able to um, update everything in real time, and uh, we thought it was the right fit for this. Other questions? So, so, yeah, so, uh, I'm sorry, so you're training a neural net network here? Yeah. Yes. Like, to do what? This one is recognizing handwritten digits. Um, 
you could, uh, it's, it's set up so we could incorporate a bunch of different data sets and you could do a bunch of different things. And ideally, you would have been able to do, you know, your own custom data. But, you know, with the time restrictions, that was not going to happen. So what you see right now is very poor performance on handwritten digits. <laughs> I think it would have been cool if you would have, uh, you know, show what you were working on, and kind of the result, like, oh, that would have been, yeah. yeah. <laughs> to iterate over. Yeah. Yeah, that would, yeah, really cool. <laughs> All right. All right. Well, hello. Hello. Hello, hello. yeah. Um, you so, did. Well, hello, is, and well, so welcome to this Quick Efficient Docker tutorial. So <laughs> there's a really, really nice uh, Docker tutorial on their website that will install your Docker software using Docker uh, toolbox, run a Safari image and container. Um, so all this good stuff. And then with lots of documentation uh, to read and to read. <laughs> <laughs> but really, really interesting. <laughs> running is asking to run Docker run hello world and that will be that will pull um, from Docker this image. Um, that what that it? Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, sorry. Um, and then task three is to run images um, and if you start, yeah that's three and then it asks you uh, to run that command so if you run it It will pull up your <laughs> image, um, and then you can see how many images you have running Docker images, <laughs> or <laughs> yeah. Um, and then the fourth one was. Oh yeah, and then afterwards it gives you pointers on how to uh, create your Docker uh, Docker file and to run your applications, and then you can exit the program and you can start building your Docker file and run your programs. Oh, yeah. Any questions? Docs, and you also get a feel for like what the build tool chain is like. Uh, 
So, so, so what would be the process to integrate like this kind of tool into the doc the docs today? It's kind of very uh, different. Not, not really like so much the interactive tutorial, although I think hiding in some corner of the internet there might actually be like the source code for the tutorial that's online. There is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's hiding somewhere in some dark corner of GitHub. Mm -hmm. But you could actually different. contribute to the code of the Docker tutorial that's like on the website. So you could actually contribute, ping Sven or whoever, and then like your changes would be deployed eventually like to a real production website for a real supposedly big person oh. company. So you, you would not you would not start this as a as a home project? Because like the, the Docker tutorial online is like fake. Common lines, JavaScript, just yeah, type exactly. Yeah. Well, that's you know, I mean, it wouldn't be the exact same, but yeah. I, you could, if you wanted to contribute to like Docker or Ink stuff, you could contribute to the docs, like the getting started docs. You know, I kind of noticed you, you know you're interested in very very first steps, um, and then also uh, the the tutorial is like yeah, it's mocked out JavaScript, but we're always looking to make it better. No, I, I like that tutorial. Yeah. Just. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Cool. So it's offline. So hey guys, welcome. Um, so we are passionate about three things. We are passionate about Docker. We're passionate about documentation, and we're passionate. Really? What? Really? Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> Strong values. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, Docker, documentation, and, uh, you know, being here today. So. Okay, so what we wanted to do is create a really easy way uh, to be able to update and make documentation um, without having to, every time you make a change, have to go in, uh, make file, clean, all that type of stuff, um, and then uh, refresh the page. So we kind of created a way to um, be able to see your changes in real time. Um, as you are editing documentation. And yes, in fact, we, we are thinking about um, React and, and how React and Webpack are really easy to, to uh, upload in real time in your, your work. And so we, we try to look at the, the documentation of Docker, which is open source on the GitHub. Uh, it's built with Hugo. But uh, we wanted to play with documentation, so we rebuilt the documentation using Sphinx, which is a, a Python documentation. So what we build is we we create a, a nice layout for Docker, and using Sphinx, we re recreate exactly the same documentation than uh, with Hugo. And what cool thing is using Docker and using the new uh, the new feature of the Docker for Mac, which has been which will be released in three weeks. For, for instance, the iNotify, which, uh, which is a way to uh, uh, track change on your computer and, and, and read and, and execute um, some, some bash script after the, the file that have been released. We can do kind of uh, webpack uh, hot related stuff. For instance, here we have uh, One minute. our uh, documentation for Docker. Uh, so it's documentation for Docker. And here, I think I will write this, uh, we have built a better documentation for Docker. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I said it. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Here we are. It's all not reloaded, so it's very really easy to 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 contribute to the documentation and to make the world of open source. Yeah, it's really, documentation is super important, and so, um, is that three minutes? Uh, oh, documentation is super important, um, as we can just see from the previous presentation, um, and uh, it's really a really good way to get your foot in the door, and a good way to also get to know uh, different forms of software and languages and things like that. So, this is a way to make it easy. So you were saying like you don't need to refresh to see the changes? Yeah. You need to refresh. So yeah. Yeah. yeah, there is a hack. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let's rephrase this. 
we so want. This is a proof of concept. <laughs> yeah, this is a proof of concept, really. Yeah. So we wanted to use uh, the identify things uh, with Ubuntu. So it's uh, what the name is. Uh, uh, yeah. So, um, but we didn't succeed. So we we found a way to to the pod reload it using script. We, we use different. We use a bash script basically to to hot reload it, not not utilizing the um, the newest form that's going to come out uh, in three weeks, just because we didn't have the time to clean it up. Um, but it's it's definitely possible, and it's definitely like a proof of concept and the importance of um, making the process easy and um, simple. So yeah, like full transparency, this does not fully utilize that newest feature. So that would mean like, you know, if I use Docker all the time, I have this, this window open on the documentation, and as soon as there's a change, it's going like, to yeah. refresh yeah. automatically. Yeah. yeah. That's cool. What do you think? Uh, it looks pretty good. Um, you know, I think that, uh, like, I know that uh, on Docker side of the house, we have a lot of interest in sort of like changing and revamping and making better the documentation, like in all ways. Um, so if you're kind of at all interested, once again, <laughs> in contributing to open source, that's a really great way to start. And it's yeah. one of our huge, open source is one of the main reasons why we did this. I actually was supposed to mention that. Um, yeah, so like this is, it's supposed to be super accessible. Um, to anyone who wants to do different implementations. Yeah, for instance, uh, we, we choose uh, Sphinx because it's one of the main uh, documentation tool. Uh, for instance, all the read the docs, I don't know if, if you know well. read the docs. It's, read a, the docs. Uh, it's a great way to, to host your own documentation, but the, the layout is not really cool, so we, we try to do the same layout as Docker. And also, I think, one of the main uh, thing with with the docs is when you want to host it, your, your 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 documentation, you have to use with the docs, and I think with Docker it's easier to host on your service. That's why we use things. Yeah, uh, yeah. So uh, this would like to me like uh, if you're interested, looks like a really good blog article waiting to happen. Uh, I don't know if you've ever seen sort of people who are like, I redesigned Microsoft's landing page or whatever. And um, you know it's a good way to sort of get a lot of attention without having to like release your own open source project or something. Um, so if you're interested, you know I personally would love to see an article of like you know we reimagined the Docker docs and then this is sort of what we came up with, different and new sort of like build pipeline and, and all this sort of stuff. Um, so you know, we did it right now, Sven. Uh, I don't know if any of you all recognize who that is, but Sven Dillardite. I think this is how he pronounce his last name. This crazy Australian guy who's been at Docker for um, over two years before me uh, is currently like going in and ripping a bunch of stuff out and like reinventing the whole like uh, CI pipeline and the way that they're deployed and stuff. So it's very much a period of sort of innovation, I'd say. Um, so yeah, I mean, if you're interested, like it's really intimidating to contribute, uh, especially if you never had it before. But you know. Um, it's definitely worth taking a look. So, yeah. we'll, we'll write a blog post. Yeah, it's, it's gonna happen. Nice. Yes. There you go. You gotta get that from the end. You guys know that I spent a lot of time thinking about things that Julian can do, so I don't have to be here until I'm <laughs> yeah. This is just another one. So I've just been and I spent 20 hours today working on. But basically what we've done is created an integrated Holberton work environment that you can install, ready to go, you can install from the uh, Docker for Mac or from the command line. It's got some cool components. One of them that's really nice is there's a uh, linter addition to the GC to uh, Emacs, and so it gives you the GCC errors in real time as you're typing. So it's like, and then the complete AI library installed even with the Keras uh, GitHub files. And then Office Libre, this is a working process because we couldn't get exports installed, but basically I give you an Office suite. It's open source. It's uh, in some ways better than Microsoft Office. <laughs> and other things, personal GitHub integration and um, Dropbox integration. That's kind of cool. So Bennett's going to walk you through some of the screens and might give you some commentary as we go. This is uh, Docker for Mac. And we have uh, downloaded them. They don't take very long, but it's going to be longer than three minutes probably. So you see, he just clicked on one of the instances. 
<clears throat> and so I'm starting up the uh, sort of the custom Emacs configuration, and um, I thought that Docker would be especially useful for like team projects where you know you have like consistent styles, and you can sort of like set configurations with Emacs, and then uh, not have to worry so much about that. Uh, so um, we installed some different modes and like other features, and one of the move I to show is this linter that sort of like uh, catches errors, syntax errors, and other kinds of errors for different languages. So uh, just start up that like, uh, C file and see if you can spot an error. So, uh, Okay, so see, there's two errors here, and so see if you can spot it, and I'll let the linter do the work for you. Um, so if I, uh, if I start up the linter here, yeah. and here we have our first error, it says, it says here on line one, um, and this is just a matter of a little typo. And then, so I'll show us our third error, and I can just jump to that error um, just using this enter feature. Um, and let's next. And basically, we have this. Uh, I forgot semicolon. So uh, this linter is useful for C, but it's also um, like you can use it for Python or Go or CSS, JSON, etc. So that's one, one, one of the features that you can just have right away with the Docker download or installation. Cool, I guess. Uh, can we show you the other parts super quick? Can you just uh, open up the Keras? Show the. Uh, so you can actually just click on it. Python and all the AI libraries are pre-installed here. And then can you toggle over at the command line? Sure. Yeah, so you can do Docker search, Docker search hold for instance. <laughs> There's a problem with your guys' software. Oh. <laughs> 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 so, uh, you're not going to Seattle here, so. <laughs> um, so to do exit here, and, uh, we'll go to that Windows um, and we we'll get the eval statement. It's open source, so it's all of our software. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it's just for um, Oh, right, all right. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah, toggle over to Safari and I see down there. Well, this is so going to be worth it, guys. <laughs> so escape, escape, escape. I'm going to go to, yeah, there. Copy that line. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's the fix. We found the fix for you. That's the name code right there, right? <laughs> the Docker machine. Pretty soon you won't have to do that at all, thankfully. And so you can do Docker pull, in which case we've already pulled it, but you can do Docker run here and it'll open up just like it did in the uh, integrated command line. And so future things are, well, we have one for stage. Any questions? So are you going to use your container from now on? Yes. Yes, we are. <laughs> um, actually, it's pretty good. It's a, it's a lot faster than Baker. Okay. And um, I think we need to My put the documentation on GitHub. Mm -hmm. So Silva is out of the judge. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so I don't know about most of you guys, but I think I'm ready to live in the century where we finally have full home automation. Because um, it's kind of depressing walking into my hostel and the lights don't flip on automatically. And the coffee machine doesn't make coffee when I wake up. And the blinds don't open. And this is all just really irritating to me. It just doesn't happen on its own. So, None of the off-the-shelf tools do this either. Uh, most of them are components, and they're like $50 just to control one plug, and this is crazy. So I'm going to roll my own solution. So that's what we did with Docker today. 
Um, so over there on that table is a Raspberry Pi running Docker, running a Flask RESTful API. And this API is what we use to control our smart home. So our smart home is whatever we want it to be. So since it's an API, you can use an Arduino, you can use other Raspberry Pis, you can use whatever to access the API and get the status. Um, so in this particular example, um, I'm going to have it step through a couple of different things. So the very first one is it's going to check the API and turn on the light. I can the reset. to actually have it control this light over here, um, but my servo with its 3D printed bracket and everything, while it looks and lines up perfectly, it couldn't have worked any better, it doesn't have enough torque to actually push the button in, uh, so that was kind of upsetting. But we can change the color of the LED. So the idea with the system um, is that when you want to add something new to it, a new feature, um, it's your design, it's your system. So we want an LED or a light or a power switch tail, plug it in, assign a port, and then tell the API there's something that's written for it. Yeah, so I'm going to run the API here locally, just for the just for demonstration. And this is actually connected to a real database which I have. Um, should I just continue that? Um, so I can go here to my API, and if I just access controllers and click enter, it should return the two controllers. So the way it's working is we have an Arduino which has basically sub-devices attached to it. Um, so currently in the API I've got it configured to contain two controllers. Um, and then from within these controllers I can go to controller main, and then devices, and then it's going to show like every single device. So this is all the devices underneath the controller main, um, and this is device ID R1, uh, R0, with a state 2, and the state refers to the, um, what do you say, like, the... 0 state. and 1 will be on and off. Uh, if there's more states than that, then it's for controlling something else. Uh, for instance, a fan speed, or the temperature of your coffee maker, or your thermostat. Yeah, so I can just go ahead, go ahead here and then change the state to state 3 and then that would ideally then change um, an LED to a different color or so the coffee machine or whatever. Get request, it will update. And the reason we have this weird syntax looking response is because the Arduino obviously isn't really wanting to communicate in JSON, so instead we just invented like our own kind of syntax for it, which is just... Yeah, it actually goes through and looks for commas and then breaks each one of those out and then breaks it up from the colon. Yeah. So that's how it's so it's taking the idea and then looking at the state for each device. So are you guys running Docker on the Arduino? Yes. Yeah. Oh. So the idea is well, not only Arduino on the Raspberry Pi. Oh okay. Yeah. And the idea of using Docker is obviously so we can like distribute this like open source and someone can download the source code. They can go on their server or Raspberry Pi, whatever they want to do, run it and then they've got a server which can handle like their Arduino. So did you run into any issues with like x86, 64 versus ARM or that kind of yeah, thing? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, what, 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 what was the OS we ended up using? Uh, we had to use some obscure OS that I've never heard of before to even get high <laughs> Docker yeah, to run. Yes. <laughs> to even get Docker to run. Yeah. We can get it going. That's cool. Cool. Awesome. 
well, a round of applause for everyone. Great hat. Yeah, super fun to watch all of these, and thanks for hacking all day on Docker. It's super awesome for us, and I'm sure you guys learned a lot of good stuff. Um, so, real quick, just to recap. First place, we have um, the winning team going to DockerCon in Seattle in T minus 19 days, 6 hours, 54 <laughs> minutes, <laughs> something like that. Second place is super awesome Docker hoodies. <laughs> we have to those. And third place are Docker mugs and hugs. By your choice of Docker person here. <laughs> Alright, let me remember who got what place. <laughs> <laughs> remember? You're good. I don't remember. <laughs> Third place, claiming Docker mugs and Docker hubs. Hugs. <laughs> 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 Yeah, or hubs. Private, private yeah, private repo on Docker Hub. Sure. Okay. Why not? Uh, Josh and Chandler. <laughs> to be claimed. Uh, yeah, to be brought to hold us on soon. <laughs> soon. Instant gratification. Okay. Second place, super awesome Docker hoodies. Team Moby Doc, John Spence and Bennett. <laughs> GG. Um, and I need a drum roll for this one. <laughs> Team Tyrion Canister. <laughs> Ha, 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 ha.